Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Naked Sun by Isaac Asimov. So as always, I'm going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll share some of my overall thoughts and rating at the end. This is uh, like a robot-themed detective novel, I guess, taking place on Solaria. Well, let's get to the blurb. On the remote planet Solaria, the first murder for 200 years has been committed. The Solarians are spacers, with a civilization based on robots instead of slaves, and some pretty weird taboos and phobias. Into this strange setup comes Terran detective Elijah Bailey, assigned to find the murderer and act as an investigator for his government. But as an Earthman, Bailey finds aspects of life on Solaria difficult, even terrifying, to cope with. Men on Earth live deep underground in their vast caves of steel and are terrified of anything outside. From the moment of his arrival on Solaria, Bailey's investigation becomes an ordeal of nerves under the pitiless glare of the naked sun. The Naked Sun is a classic novel of imaginative science fiction. It displays Isaac Asimov's unrivaled talents at their masterly best. So uh, very early on, um, we get the uh, the reunion between El Elijah Bailey and uh, R. Daniel. And I just thought it was a lot of fun to see those two back together because I have read the book that came before this, which was The Caves of Steel. Um, and I enjoyed that as well. And so Daniil is eating, um, eating, it says, Under normal conditions, Bailey might have found the food delicious. Now he ate mechanically. He noted abstractly that Daniil also ate with a kind of unimpassioned efficiency. Later on, of course, the robot would empty the fluorocarbon sack within him into which the eaten food was now being stored. Meanwhile, Daniil maintained his masquerade. I find that interesting because it's Bailey is the one who's uh, eating mechanically, as opposed to Daniil, who's actually a robot. And so, um, we get this conversation and I just think this is interesting. It shows a lot of the different politics and the different viewpoints people have. And yet, said Bailey, I'm not a Salarian. I'm an Earthman. I don't like robots doing what I want to do. Consider too, said Daniil, that to cause distress to a robot might be considered on the part of our hosts to be an act of impoliteness, since in a society such as this, there must be a number of more or less rigid beliefs concerning how it is proper to treat a robot and how it is not. To offend, to offend our hosts would scarcely make our task easier. All right, said Bailey, let the robot do its job. He settled back. The incident had not been without its uses. It was an educational example of how remorseless a robotic society could be. Once brought into existence, robots were not so easily removed, and a human who wished to dispense with them, even temporarily, found he could not. And this is interesting too. Damn it, what questions does one ask anyway on a strange world, he said. How legal is robotic evidence, Daniil? What do you mean? Can a robot bear witness on Solaria? Can it give evidence? Why should you doubt it? A robot isn't human, Daniil. On Earth, it cannot be a legal witness. And yet a footprint can, partner Elijah, although that is much less a human than a robot is. The position of your planet in this respect is illogical. On Solaria, robotic evidence, when competent, is admissible. This was interesting too. Hannes Gruer was still eating when contact was established. He ate slowly, choosing each mouthful carefully from a variety of dishes, peering at each anxiously, as though searching for some hidden combination, and Bailey thought he may be a couple of centuries old. Eating may be getting dull for him. And uh, this society, they've kind of evolved. They only really see each other through like a, futuris a futuristic equivalent of Zoom calls, basically. Uh, it's kind of relatable, because we're currently living in a global pandemic, so I haven't seen anybody for ages. <laughs> so uh, here we see this in action. People are actually like averse to being close to people, and I found it relatable. I will be frank, Mr. Bailey. I imagine I can smell you. Bailey automatically leaned back in his chair, painfully self-conscious. Smell me? Quite imaginary, of course, said Kumo. I cannot say whether you do have an odour or how strong it is, but even if you had a strong one, my nose filters would keep it from me. Yet yeah, imagination, he shrugged his shoulders. I understand. It's worse. You'll forgive me, Mr. Bailey, but in the actual presence of a human, I feel strongly as though something slimy were about to touch me. I keep shrinking away. It is most unpleasant. Yeah, I get that around people as well. And uh, just some interesting stuff here that I'm going to read out. Uh, Kumo grew warmer as he spoke. Civilizations have always been pyramidal in structure. As one climbs towards the apex of the social edifice, there is increased leisure and increased opportunity to pursue happiness. As one climbs, one finds also fewer and fewer people to enjoy this more and more. Invariably, there is a preponderance of the dispossessed. And remember this, no matter how well off the bottom layers of the pyramid might be on an absolute scale, they are always dispossessed in comparison with the apex. For instance, even the most poorly off humans in Aurora are better off than Earth's aristocrats, but they are dispossessed with respect to Aurora's aristocrats, and it is with the masters of their own world that they compare themselves. 
So there is always social friction in ordinary human societies. The action of social revolution and the reaction of guarding against such revolution or combating it once it has begun are the causes of a great deal of the human misery with which history is permeated. Uh, I enjoyed this reference. Bailey said thoughtfully, all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. You've hit it. Where's that from? Some old document, said Bailey. I mean, I'm not American, but I'm pretty sure that's the Declaration of Independence. And we get this interesting thing here of uh, why robots can't be used in surgery. Robots in surgery? First law makes that very difficult, plainclothesman. A robot might perform an appendectomy to save a human life if he knew how, but I doubt if it'd be usable after that without major repairs. Cutting human flesh would be quite a traumatic experience for a positronic brain. Human doctors can manage to get hardened to it, even to the personal presence required. And, um... They talk about robots, uh, like looking after the children, and um, and we get, you would know Bailey if you ever tried to teach a robot the importance of discipline. First law makes them almost impervious to that fact. And don't think youngsters don't learn that about as soon as they can talk. I've seen a three year old holding a dozen robots motionless by yelling, you'll hurt me, I'm hurt. It takes an extremely advanced robot to understand that a child might be deliberately lying. We get, a, we get a reference to eugenics. Lovely. And this is interesting uh, how people get married in this society. Once the youngsters graduate out of the farm, how do you get them to court one another? Court? Get to know one another, said Bailey, vaguely wondering how the thought could be expressed safely. So that they can marry. That's not their problem, said Clarissa. They're matched by gene analysis, usually when they're quite young. That's the sensible way, isn't it? Are they always willing? To be married? They never are. It's a very traumatic process. And here we get basically the crux of how the laws of robotics are broken in this, which is why the story happens to begin with. I'll quote the second law. A robot must obey the orders given it by a human being, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. So you see, my orders should have been ignored. This is nonsense. The robot lacked knowledge. Bailey leaned forward in his chair. Ah, we have it. Now let's recite the first law as it should be stated. A robot may do nothing that, to its knowledge, will harm a human being, nor through an action, knowingly allow a human being to come to harm. Because basically it postulated that two robots could murder somebody. Let's say one put some poison in a glass of milk and the other gave the milk to the person, but they didn't communicate that fact in between each other. The one robot would think, oh, it's fine, no, you know, I've just put the poison in the milk because I've been ordered to. And the other one would think, oh, it's fine, I'm just delivering some milk. He wouldn't, you know, know that it was poisoned milk. And then we get a theme of, uh, has somebody been killed because they're too good, because they're the model citizen, and we don't tend to like model citizens. So yeah, overall, I think there were some great little bits to this, uh, a nice murder mystery to the heart of it, you know, it kept me guessing towards the end, but also there are all these little bits of, like, philosophy which I enjoyed as well, which Asimov is great at doing. And I also just always love when he plays with the laws of robotics, when he states this is how robots work, and then he finds a way to bypass what seemed to be fairly, uh, you know, comprehensive laws, I guess. So yeah, I gave The Naked Sun by Isaac Asimov a 4 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Naked Sun by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.